we're going to talk about not just sharing components, but how to break up your code into multiple projects. Uh, a lot of times people, as they're building out their code bases, as it grows organically over time, um, they hit spots where they're like, oh, there's a section here that I actually like to just carve out and be able to share separately from the rest of my code. Or maybe there's a section here I'd like to be able to reuse across something else. So um, as applications become more complex, we're starting to look for solutions to manage our code, and we want solutions that help us keep things clean and clear, keep things contained in smaller, more manageable chunks, and we want to be able to intentionally share specific bits across other projects. And more and more, I'm hearing a lot of UI teams saying, hey, let's just break it up, and is this the right thing to do? So the answer is no, generally speaking. But, well, maybe. So let's talk about it. Um, the reason I say no is because a lot of times it's an easy thing to jump to, and it comes with a lot of complexities that people don't stop to, to realize. And um, it often is the right thing to do, but we want to make sure we stop and think about the strategies. So um, some things to know about the content we're going to be getting into. Uh, this isn't for the faint of heart, but it's an amazingly powerful process and strategy uh, when you get it right. Sometimes that takes some effort and it takes some persistence. Um, so one of the people that asked me, you know, what should I know about this? If I was going to break it up, I said, you should be afraid. Be very afraid. There's a lot of rat holes you can get sucked down into. Um, so some of the, these bullet points might not make sense for some of us until we actually get into some of the code. Uh, we're not going to dive too deep into the code, but I'm going to show some examples. Uh, but let me just get this out now. Breaking code up into multiple projects can get messy really fast. And if you're new to it, it can have you banging your head against things that should be like simple 15-minute tasks for days, maybe longer. Uh, dependency management across projects will generally be one of the ugliest monsters to deal with because you're starting to break out. I have this project and it has these dependencies. I have this project and it has these dependencies. And oh, there's the same library, but I have different versions. Uh, and sometimes that doesn't play well. So you're going to have to figure out how do we, how do I figure out how to reconcile these things? How do I manage this? Um, so that's probably the ugliest monster to deal with if you're doing regular JavaScript and ES6. If you introduce TypeScript, uh, you're going to have a whole another level of complexity. Type definitions for nested NPM dependencies across multiple projects where you have interdependencies across your projects. I have something here with TypeScript. I have something here with TypeScript. I have something here with TypeScript. These two things depend on that one thing, and this one thing depends on another. That introduces a whole another level of hell as far as debugging and tracking what's going on. There's no magic weapon for it. You just have to get through it. And I say bring extra health to the battle and beef up on your endurance before you get in. But you can get through it. Um, one thing that's probably the biggest thing to keep in mind is as uh, the more complex your interdependencies get between the many projects that you're breaking apart, if you have one project that's a component library and just one app, it's pretty straightforward. If I have one component library and several apps, and I want to be able to manage what's going on across my apps and be updating something, and I, I want to update this component library for something I need in this one project, but all the other, up, uh, other apps, as soon as they update, they're going to get that same update. Those are things we have to keep track of. Um, the more complex the interdependencies or the more nested interdependencies between your projects, the more pain you're at risk of suffering. Not that you're guaranteed to, it's just a risk to keep in mind. And as long as you keep that in mind and are looking for strategies to simplify your project's interdependency graph, that will go a long ways and will make it more manageable. So that said, it can be done. And when you get it working, it opens up powerful new options for teamwork and collaboration. And my recommendation, especially if it's not something you've taken on before, is to find someone to pair up on this with. It's a whole lot easier and more fun when you're not doing it alone. You'll run into scenarios where you're going to be banging your head against something and they'll come over and go, oh, it's just that. It's like, holy cow, why did I not see that? Those kinds of things. Um, but but uh, again, it, it's good to have a couple pairs of eyes and somebody to help you know keep the humor in the middle of it. So the biggest challenges or scenarios that I usually hear people asking are, one, we already know we're going to have to manage multiple projects. We haven't really gotten going too far, but we know from the get-go we want to break things out. We just need the right strategy to start with. The other scenario is we've grown and we have a few different projects going on, and now we realize we have similar concepts in each of them, 
and we want to normalize. We, we want to, it's getting brittle, it's getting hard to manage and keep in sync. So the duplication of code means management is, uh, we're managing more code than necessary, and we also have a higher risk of bugs over time, so we should definitely figure out a way to start sharing common code across projects. How do we do that? Um, so some of the terms we're going to cover, I'll, there's a column that's just basically a name of the concepts that you might see as you're Googling or, or reading through articles on this. Uh, and then I'm giving some links to specific tools that are used to address these that, that um, are rather common and, and that I recommend. The first concept is local NPM package linking. I, uh, Jeff mentioned mono repos and, and Lerna, and that's a, that's a a great concept, but there is a strategy just using regular local package linking. And um, you can use either NPM or Yarn. They both have a command for this. Uh, and it's essentially the, the concept of sim linking between uh, two packages and being able to say, hey, I have both of these installed locally, and this one is a dependency of that one, and somehow I'm able to link the two so that NPM recognizes that. And as my tools run, it should be able to, to go across that sim link or that alias to, to look at the code in my other working space that's on my local machine. The workspace is a concept that we're going to hear that applied to both mono repos and uh, something called multi repos that you don't hear quite as much about, but it's definitely a strategy we should be aware of. Um, then there's the mono, multi, mono repo, multi repo, we should understand what those are individually. Uh, and then if we're talking about all this stuff, it's really important to understand how to set up a local NPM registry so that you can test these things without having to be throwing all kinds of stuff into your company's uh, regular registry that everybody's going to be pulling from. So as developers, it's good to have a tool for that. And there's, on the tool side, uh, at the bottom you can see I linked to something called Verdasio. I highly recommend it if you have to use something local because it's uh, no config setup, very easy to get going. Documentation is pretty straightforward. I'm going to point you to a tutorial that walks through setting up a mono repo and includes some instruction for that as well. Um, so, starting at the top, the, lo no, the local NPM package linking, if you're just playing with two repos locally and you don't want to go through all the other things, you can just use NPM link or yarn link, depending on what your preferred package manager is. And then if you're working with workspaces as a mono repo, there's two tools. There's yarn workspaces, which is a, a, a good way to uh, get a mono repo set up. Uh, but then there's also Lerna, which is a more robust tool, which you'll probably see more written about because it's being used by a lot of large uh, libraries and even some organizations, and it's become pretty popular. And it's got a robust set of commands for managing multiple projects within one workspace. Uh, and then when it comes to working with a multi-repo, there's a few different strategies out there. People have talked about trying to use like Git submodules and Git subtrees. I would highly advise you advise, uh, avoid that, and then consider using a tool like mgit. It's actually uh, in GitHub, it's under mgit2, but the com at the command line, you just use mgit, uh, mgit2, because there was already an mgit out there. Um, but it's a great tool, and we're going to see how that, uh, a few things about that as we move forward. Um, so we just kind of went over the local NPM project linking. Like I said, it might be okay for simple one-time scenarios, or while you're sorting out your uh, more comprehensive solution. And, uh, but I tend to discourage it for routine team use, everyday team use, because it's, it's difficult to scale. It, it, it's got some overhead with it that just keeping up with it is difficult. And it's got some interesting challenges like deduping, and there's a link there uh, where that's mentioned in, in here, uh, where if you have multiple projects and you have a, a similar uh, trying to link to a similar pro, uh, sim similar dependency package and you have all these same links going across, trying to remove one, you end up so with some issues. So uh, talking about workspace, we'll step on to talking about workspaces and this is, we're going into mono repos and multi repos now. Workspaces is gonna be a term you'll see a lot. All it means, it's a top level container project in which you nest multiple child uh, projects that you want to work on together, and hopefully the workspace has some descriptor that defines the workspace construct. And uh, my thoughts are, are on this is, it's a good idea, it becomes a great idea when you can define your construct for a workspace in a way that can be shared across team members. 
So something that I can take this, I've described my workspace, I can pass it to someone else somehow, ideally by checking it into GitHub, versioning it, branching it, um, but it allows me to share a work in process or progress state for a collective workspace and all the, the things, all the child projects under it quickly and easily with my colleagues without totally screwing up their entire local dev environment. Uh, a lot of times if you, uh, teams are just getting into it and they're using NPM linking, you'll see them, uh, I've seen teams sometimes spend uh, a couple days where they've got their own environment working and then they want to try to emulate something somebody else has and then getting back to what they had before it proves to be a challenge and is a lot more work than they expected. So um, let's really quick just talk about the differences between mono workspaces and multi-repo workspaces. You want to work with multiple projects, and this can be NPM or otherwise. You can use a mix of you might have server-side projects as well. Um, do they all go in one get repo, or you just, do you distribute them across multiple repos? And when you're distributing them, usually I see people do one project per repo. The difference between mono repo and multi repo, hopefully for a lot of you the name makes sense, but for mono repo, you're going to nest everything, uh, all your nested working projects within one Git repo. So you have them nested. There's a top level repo, you have a bunch of child repos underneath that. Each one is its own NPM package, but they all go into one GitHub uh, repo. Uh, and it makes it so that everything stays is easier to keep consistent and stays in one place and you don't have to worry about somebody changing one thing on you while you're changing another and things getting out of sync quite as easily. Uh, the downside to it is you have to pull out everything or nothing. When you're pulling down it, if you want to work on a mono repo, you pull the whole thing down, you work on it, you make a branch, you put everything back in. Uh, the downside is you sometimes run into uh, Git conflicts things you have to resolve between merges, it, there's a little bit more overhead. Um, the other downside uh, that a lot of people are asking for is uh, you can't share one project with one group without sharing all of the projects. So if you want to have some separation between teams that are working or if you want to allow them to, to be able to fork and branch just one of the, the sub-projects, you can't really do that conveniently with a, a mono repo in the same way you can with a multi-repo. With multi-repo, you distribute your work across multiple repos. Um, and both strategies are really useful, but I think it's worth stating that for NPM projects, the mono repo is generally the recommended st uh, strategy by the community, especially when it's UI code. Now, I need to pause just to make, uh, just to state something here. From what I understand, we have a weird timing thing where our screen, our projector may turn off and the screens may go up exactly at 8 o'clock. We just have to reboot the system and get them back down. So we'll keep talking as that goes if that happens. Just a heads up so it's not a surprise. Um, so that said, as we're just like two minutes away, let's start looking at code. So in the mono repo example, I'm actually just going to show you here. Uh, this is a Part of the tutorial that I'm going to give a link to in, in a couple slides from now, um, I started writing up an overview of uh, pulling pieces together from when I've done mono repos with other teams, and just trying to pull it together, get up to date, make sure I'm t saying the what's uh, true for the latest state of things. And as I was trying to, starting to write that out, there were a bunch of things I wasn't going to be able to dive into, like TypeScript can be a headache, and I we wouldn't have time to really go into that much. And as I was looking at it, I ran across this amazing article that goes into depth on a level that you just would not have gotten from me at all in any way. Um, so uh, I think, uh, oh, actually this is not the one. Let me go back to the slides. It's actually a little bit, let me just grab it real quick. Uh, one more. Oh. I might have the wrong link. It's, uh, there's actually a four part, and I'm going to have to update the link. Alex, you don't happen to have that, do you? On your repo, on your thing? Uh, no, not here, but I think I smacked it. Okay, you look it up while we do that. Um, so it's actually, it's, uh, that was not the right tutorial, but um, if you look at, at this repo, we found that the, uh, they had an example GitHub. Huh? You're not protected. Well, that would be why. There we go. So while we reboot this, I'll keep talking about, um, basically, it, it was a four-part, very long for each part, 
overview that walks you through stepping up a, um, an NPM Lerna TypeScript, all kinds of extra stuff repo, and there we go. So um, the thing to notice about this is this is a mono repo, and one of the ways we can tell, uh, you can see it's already got its own top level package.json. There's also a packages folder, and the traditional standard is when you have a mono repo or even a multi repo, your children, by default, if you don't define something other, will go into a packages subdirectory because they're npm packages, and that's what the community has kind of adopted as a standard. You can define it to be something else, uh, but that's what it will usually end up being. So we, if we open that, you can see this is just an example of making a component. It's just going to be one component in this example, just to be, keep it simple. Uh, and then a, an application that, that uses that component. So this is a concept of a component library and a, an application. So if we open up this input project, it's its own application, or it's its own little library. It's got its own package.json file. It's got its own tsconfig. You can compile this thing all by itself, and it will produce output that you can then import into other projects. And in the same form, the login form is a little app. It's got its own package.json. It's got its own tsconfig here. You might have Webpack instead or Rollup. Um, but these are their own standalone little NPM packages. They're, they're full-fledged NPM packages. And so if you create these as a, a library that you want to bundle and um, publish to NPM, you can do that on an individual basis for each project or child project like this inside this one repo. They don't have to be in their own repo. A lot of people make the assumption that it has to be its own separate repo to be able to publish up to NPM uh, registries. And that's not true. You actually can have as many as you want inside of a um, single repo, and it doesn't actually matter where they're located. When you go into that level, if you've made it an NPM project, you can publish from there. Keeping them in one folder or in a specific folder structure, like under packages or under um, child projects or whatever you want to call it, is a, a good way, though, for keeping things consistent and for being able to configure tooling that you might use to manage across these multiple projects. And there are some things that would be helpful to be able to do. Um, so this is a uh, mono repo with uh, Babel TypeScript and Lerna and at the top, if we go up here, they've even put Jest and Storybook in. And so it's, it's a pretty well-rounded project here. Uh, we could create multiple other projects under that packages folder. We could make other apps. We could make other libraries. We can link in between them. And one of the things that Lerner brings to the table, now let me, uh, let me grab my uh, command line here. So. We just type Lerna, and so, uh, whoops, how did I miss? Command. Oh, that's right. Let's do the help. So if, you, uh, if you're using a Lerna tool, the Lerna help will give you a list of commands. The website is also uh, very good. Uh, but you can say, see, Lerna, add, and then you give a package. It'll add a dependency. Um, to all the packages, if you don't specify a scope, scope means to do it only for these packages or and ignore, ignore these specific packages. Um, bootstrapping will go ahead and uh, essentially go through all of your packages and install whatever the dependencies are in them. And something that you should know about, there's this concept called hoisting, which is if you have NPM dependencies across multiple packages, and Yarn Workspaces does this as well. It'll say if it, if it exists in multiple repo or multiple projects, then I'm duplicating my installs across all of these things. I can actually bring it up one level into that top level root and put it in the node modules there. And because of the way NPM dependency resolution works, it'll look in your current the current level that you're at when you're, you're trying to resolve dependencies. And if it doesn't find it there, it'll go up the chain to see if it's in your, your parent. And then it'll look eventually in your global space to see if it's available. So by putting it up in the parent root, for the, or the parent uh, uh, node modules, for the most part, that will allow you to resolve dependencies that exist across your child projects 
with only one install, which is great and it, it's fast. Um, the problem is, though, that we're actually abusing a package manager designed for server side packages. NPM was not initially designed for front end developers. We just happen to pick it up and it's really convenient and we like it, and so we use it like crazy. There are some packages out there that if they're not bundled and, and published correctly, they won't resolve properly when, if they're hoisted. So there's some options for um, managing hoisting. There's some links I'll, I'll give to get to it a little bit. Um, it's just something to be aware of. For the most part, the vast majority of the times, it's probably not going to be an issue. It's just something to be aware of. Um, but Learn uh, works. Let me step back and say, Yarn workspaces um, will help you bootstrap and install dependencies in the children as well, uh, and, and do this kind of almost same concept as what Bootstrap does by just calling Yarn install at the top level. But the things that Yarn brings uh, is you can check and see what's changed across your children repos, and it'll give you a readout. Uh, you can. Clean, which just basically says clean out all my node modules and all the, the subdirect or my child projects. There's a couple of other things that are kind of cool here, but the one that is actually probably most popular is the fact that you can publish and you can version. And if you just version bump, it's going to go through and find out where there's changes in your uh, sub repos or sub uh, projects. I'm sorry, and um, will bump the version since the last release. And you can set up Learnet to either do that where all the projects stay in sync, so if there's any changes in one of them, it'll bump the version for all of them, or you can have it be independent. So if there's changes in one project and not in others, it'll bump the version for that one project and not the others. And you can publish that one project to your NPM registry independently. It's pretty powerful. So there's a lot more we can you can get into, but we need to, to move on. So I'm going to step back to the... Uh, presentation here. So, so that's a, a mono repo example, and we just saw it, it's got all the projects all together. That one, I didn't step into actually trying to run code in that one, because I think the example for the multi-repo is the one where it's more important to actually see what it does and how it works. So a multi-repo example is uh, that I like to point everybody to if they're asking about it is CK Editor, and this is a WYSIWYG editor that I've been using for a really long time. Uh, I won't say how long. Uh, the people that run that have been developing this have been doing some phenomenal things. It's a wicked smart team. And um, they have this mono repo, and you're going to see they have uh, a package, JSON, where they have a bunch of dependencies to their own stuff. And right next to it, that package JSON is something called mgit, or is a file called mgit json and that mgit is a tool developed by one of their developers it's the one i mentioned earlier for multi um, git management tool and if you look in it they've got the same dependencies that are in their package.json and here's the name of each package and then here's a um, here's a path to where it is within their github repo if, you, if you're defining the, the, this as part of your own GitHub repo, you can just use this short thing. Um, you can also put in a full Git URL, like HTTP Git or Git uh, colon slash slash whatever the path is to your projects. Um, you can put a hash at the end, put on a version number or a tag or a Git hash for a specific commit. And when you use mgit, it will go grab those from GitHub, not from NPM. It'll grab them from GitHub and pull them together and create something that looks like a mono repo. It's not, but it'll look like one. So we're going to actually step into uh, the code again. And let me step over to uh, here. This is a little bit bigger. And I need to clean this out because I just tested to make sure I could do this, but that we weren't going to have any. Uh, Nope. Let's not remove that one. OK. So I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so we can see what happens here. So I'm going to just quickly grab into, not that one. Where we go? Come on. 
Oops, I just left it. There we go. There we go. So I'm just going to go here. I'm just going to do a regular. We're going to clone it, and we're going to run through the mgit setup. So click git clone. And I'm actually going to close this out so we can start it up with the first thing. So we're going to go CD, CK editor, five. So this was just pulled. And if we just look at it, it's got package JSON, it's got mgit, it's got docs. So I'm just going to go ahead and open this up in VS Code. And then I'm going to, let me, oops. In the wrong screen here. So if I refresh this here, oh, that didn't quite work, did it? Huh? Let me, why is it not doing it? Oh, we're actually, uh, is it stuck? Restart this. Uh, I seem to be locked. Hold on just a second. Let me see if I can. See if it'll let me do that. There we go. There we go. All right. So we have, they have a, um, they're in Git, hidden GitHub. Folder, they have docs, they have scripting. This is for scripts for managing across all the uh, NPM projects that should be in here, but they're not here. So if you try to run these scripts, they'll error out. They won't do anything. Um, so to get this set up, I was able to pull out down just the top level workspace, but it's not actually a full working environment until I do one more thing. So if I open up the, uh, area here, let me make my, whoops, font size larger. That's not doing it. So here, if I run, uh, first of all, I'm just going to run mgit so you can see what it spits out. And actually, I guess we need to be a little bit smaller so it looks a bit cleaner. I don't know if you can all read that, but it basically says mgit. It's a tool for managing projects built uh, using multiple repositories. It says you pass in mgit your command, some options, and optionally some git options if you're trying to do things against git. Um, when you have an mgit file or mgit.json file specified that outlines what you want your pod projects to be pulled in as, um, you at the bottom there's one that says sync and it updates all the packages to the latest versions or install missing ones. So let's use that. So we're just going to do mgit sync. And what it'll do is it'll run through your config file and you'll see a block spit out for what it's doing for each project. And there's a couple of other commands that you can run where it's going to run across all these child uh, packages that also happen to be individual GitHub repos. And you can run Git tasks across all of them. So if we open this up, this actually happens to be a really big one. This is one where I would say they have a lot of complexity to manage, but they also have a few people to help them do it, which is nice. Uh, but you can see they've got a ton of projects here. Uh, if I were to go in and change, let's just say I change something in one of them. Let's just add a constant. Terrible example. But if I save it now, and if I close this, it would be helpful to know where I have changes. Um, mgit is this awesome tool for, for finding that. Oops. mgit, no, git. <coughs> Status is probably one of the commands I think I, I use probably the most if I'm in this kind of environment. It lists out all of the child GitHub repos that you have and show you 
here's for this package name, here's the branch you're on, here's the commit you're on, and here's your status. And then when it's red and for accessibility, they maybe they should do something other than just color. But if it's red, um, that means modified files. There's some symbols, there are some symbols here that will will help figure it out. You can find out if your branch is ahead or behind, uh, if you've got staged files, if you've got untracked files. You can even find out if it's not on the same branch as specified in Git. And that happens when somebody drops down into a folder and does a checkout of another branch. You can do that. It's not against the rules. It'll just inform you. So it makes it so that you are aware of what you're doing and whether or not you're in sync if you're going to be pushing up to something where it's not the same branch as what you've got specified here. There's a lot more commands that we can go into here, but this is one of the tools that not a lot of people know about. Learner, you're going to find a lot of articles around. Uh, Yarn workspaces, you'll probably find less, but you'll find some good material around. How to manage a multi-repo environment is something that there's not a lot of people writing about. It's generally, it has been generally discouraged, but I'm seeing it's becoming more and more popular. And the idea of saying, I want to be able to have a shared component library. I want to be able to collaborate with some other people. I want to let them get in and be able to work on it. But I don't want them seeing my application code, or I don't want them seeing another library that I have that's proprietary. How do I do that kind of thing? At that point, you're starting to get into the multi-repo space. And this is one where there's a lot of challenges. It can get really deep really fast. So um, this mgit tool, what I generally recommend people do, leverage mgit. And uh, we'll get back to the examples here. Like I said, Yarn, Workspaces, and Lerna, we've already said they're both for mono repo. You can see in Yarn's own documentation, they say Yarn's workspaces are for low level, level primitives uh, that tools like Lerna can and do use. So you can actually use Yarn within Lerna. You can have it configured to use NPM as your uh, NPM client, either way. But it's all around uh, mono repos. Uh, when you get in, and this is the, the link, I'll update this for the, uh, the right, right tutorial to, to get you there. But when you get into multi-workspace, uh, multi-repo workspaces, that's where it really becomes kind of a beast. And um, it, again, worth stating, it's generally recommended, go for the mono-repos, but if you have a good scenario, I highly recommend use mgit for your multi-git repo management. Don't try to use git subtree uh, or... Um, Oh, it's actually git subtree or git modules or submodules. Uh, do try to keep things mono repo ish and have kind of mono repo friendly patterns and practices, with the one exception we mentioned where there's hoisting. And expect to have to custom script for a lot of the things you might get with Lerna. You probably might want to still use Lerna. I find there's some, some benefit in kind of blending it, but depending on what your specific scenario is, you'll find that you might have certain Lerna commands that because of the scenario, how you've put things together, command doesn't work. You might actually need to write a, uh, um, a regular NPM script. And uh, if we go to the uh, CK editor example, uh, they actually used to use, whoops, they actually used to use Lerna, but they, uh, they've actually gone back to the yarn Solution, there's my cursor. But if you go in, you'll see they have uh, in their scripts, they've just created a lot of NPM scripts for doing some of the things that you might have gotten out of the box with Lerna, where they got to a situation with all of their NPM repos. They said, you know what, let's just simplify. We're going to use a, the um, Yarn workspace to get us all of our links together, and we're going to write the scripts for some of the things like publishing and updating and things like that. Um, Expect that if you're going to go for a multi-repo, you will have some extra overhead, but it's totally doable. Uh, so final advice in general is, is splitting up code repos is actually a great idea for many of the complex situations we have these days. Just be thoughtful and careful about when and how you choose to do it. If you're using tooling like Yarn Workspaces, Lerna, or MGit, expect them to break sometimes. And when it does, just remember it's just tooling. As developers, we should be able to get by without them in a pinch if we have to. Um, so developers need to know how to work without the luxury of these tools for a while, and we should make sure they know how. Uh, I guess 
you almost could use Verdasio even in the context of using these tools, but a lot of times once you really get these things streamlined, your developers don't need to know half your developers won't need to know how to get a local NPM uh, registry set up. It won't be as important because you've, you're going to make something that's consistent, repeatable, it's scripted. They just do it and it works. But if and when they do, uh, or if you have things where you actually have to have developers test at a, a lower level first, um, get them using these kinds of tools. And I, I'm going to put out a couple of Warnings, if you're going to be using a local NPM registry, I have some rules I usually ask teams to follow. Have a clear strategy for how developers should be playing with version numbers. When you publish, you have to put a new version number out for it to take, right? I don't like there being duplication of version numbers published. Even if one was local and then one was public, I know it seems like it should be harmless, but there are times when you end up with somebody who forgets to update something and they're local and they're coming off of pay uh, publishing to their local thing, they want to go publish to the, the regular repo that the rest of the organization uses, and they forgot they've just bumped it 17 versions while they were testing, and you've only bumped the last person to use the regular one goes ahead and bumps it once. They go push their changes, forget about what's going on, not paying attention. I've seen people get code out into production that shouldn't have been out there. So if you're going to be doing something like this, have your developers communicate. Make sure you're keeping track of saying, hey, I'm publishing out. This is the last version I have. All the developers across the board keep in sync about this so that when you're ready to switch back to your, your regular registry, just do a publish with the next version. You might jump a few versions on your minor patches type things, but as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's okay, and that's a, a good way to just get some sanity and keep it, uh, keep it safe. And the last thing is, we've gone really fast over a lot of content. I want to leave some time for questions. Um, there's some links. I'll put the slides up afterwards. You can dive in and you can read on your own and, and get into it. This is a topic that, as some people get into it, they find for some scenarios it goes really easy. For other scenarios, it can be complex and hairy. Um, we have situations here at, at Cloud Health where we're still trying to work out. We use TypeScript. We use uh, a, a couple of different levels of, of abstraction, so trying to nail down exactly what's going to be the right solution and the right architecture for us, something we're actually, I'm still going through and debugging some of the things that we have challenges for, um, but it's absolutely doable. I'm curious, is this something that people are interested in doing, and is there enough interest to maybe start talking about putting together a workshop? So I'm just going to throw that out there as an open question, and we can uh, come talk to me afterwards if it's something that you think your team is at all uh, interested in maybe collaborating around. Um, and finally, I have to give the plug. Cloud Health is an awesome place to work with. Uh, I really, really love it here. We're hiring. Of course, we're growing. We're always hiring. We're part of VMware now, too, which is another thing that I consider really great. Uh, I've worked for VMware in the past, and when I found out that they were actually acquiring us back in, was, I think, October, November, um, it was probably the only company that I would have, I was glad to stick around for because I really enjoy what, what VMware does and their, their uh, mindset around things. So you can go to the website and check us out. And that's it. So do we have questions? Of course. Uh, yeah, I, so I, um, I'm just curious. Um, Wait, you have, to, you have to say, you've already, a little bit closer, but you have to say you've already experienced this before. Yes, David and I actually worked together, and he came in and consulted at a company that I was at, and he actually um, worked, uh, I learned a lot uh, on that process of getting a lot of our stuff together. We were working with multi-repo at the You were, yep. Which was a little pain, we, was very sort of painful, I think, at the start, but I think um, after David came in, got Lerner in, and got a lot of the processes in place, um, the dev team was very uh, appreciative, and I think things worked a lot better. So uh, your question. Yeah, the question. Um, so um, how granular do you get when you're kind of thinking about um, um, like extracting code? Like I noticed in some repos, they, like every, there's a package for just a button mm -hmm. or you know, an input and all that stuff. So, or in then others, there's just a whole UI of button input and all that stuff. So yep. what, what do you recommend in terms of um, so, kind of doing yeah. that? What's the... So uh, that, that depends on the strategy that you have as a, as a team. Uh, I understand the idea of going super granular. And if you actually want to go super granular to the point where you're going to version every single component, there's actually a s platform out there for it. I think it's called Bit. Um, it works pretty well. If you actually want to go to that level of granularity, you should definitely check that out and do not take it on by, your, by yourselves. 
I would not recommend you try to go take that level of granularity on unless you actually have like one or two developers who can be dedicated to help maintain that and maintain the, the, the pipeline for builds and, and continuous integration and all of that. Um, that said, there are some interesting levels of granularity. Like we abstract out things really that might seem kind of silly, like configuration for tools like Pretty and Jest and TS Lint. Uh, abstracting it out as its own library that can just be imported and used turns out to be really great because we have some other to development tools or uh, other teams that want to use uh, different. They're, they're, what they're trying to build is something different, but they want to stay consistent with our configuration and our best practices. So having those called out as its own little tiny NPM project actually makes sense. Uh, there's not really an awful lot of overhead as far as build pipeline or anything like that with those. Um, but then the idea, like personally, uh, I'm a big fan of calling out certain things that are going to be part of your regular runtime bootstrap boilerplate, stuff that's going to happen every single time. Like if you have to go fetch uh, a user session and authenticate things for what navigation items to show, you could wrap that up and make it so that it's something that's driven by configuration at the app level and you can get from environment configurations and then your developers don't touch that anymore. It, they just wrap their stuff in your little shell and um, there's actually a WPA, the, uh, or I'm sorry, PWA, Progressive Web Apps, has this concept of an app shell and then you have your, your individual feature slices or app slices as the, the top level views but everything that goes around it you don't put into every single app, you actually make that as something that's just, it's there and your little app slices or feature slices uh, just load into it. Those are things that you can abstract out very easily. Um, I've seen some people abstract out things like their uh, uh, service integrations. They know that our endpoint is always the same uh, at, with a little tiny bit of configuration. We just set up the service integration for GraphQL and whatever rests endpoints we have, uh, we, the client gets bundled in so that by the time a developer is ready to start writing their view, the thing's already in the application and you can just start making a request to it and you don't actually have to do that setup for your client. Uh, those are things that could be abstracted. It depends on what you find useful as a team. Uh, it's, not, it's one of those things, unfortunately, it's not one solution fits all now. Thank you. I have a question in the back. For MGIF, right? MGIF's the sort of the new animal, I think, for a lot of us, certainly for me. Um, I was wondering, though, whether you could like, put it in narrative terms. Do you know of companies or organizations that are using MGIF to manage their uh, multi repo strategy? Um, and do you have any stories as to why they're using it? Yeah, so um, actually, Jeff was probably one of the, the last larger organizations. Uh, there are a few blocks over, uh, a company called Continuum. They wanted to have their repos broken out so that individual teams could work on an application, but was actually, which was actually a feature slice. And at the end, they wanted to have um, a primary team be able to take these individual applications and they would be bundled as libraries. So you could get the at the top level view, but the developers working in it could work in those as an application. So they could be bundled as an app or as a library. When they're developing, they can run their little app and it's fine and it's got some navigation around it, but it gives them the feature that they're working on with all of the shared resources for the component libraries and some of the other features that uh, they needed. We also broke out um, all of the Webpack and like build time CI time scripts into a library that you could import into each of them and be able to do all of the regular build processes. And so you could pull out just one of those and work with it in isolation. But then when it was time to deploy, they actually had a top level, but it was actually a sibling inside the packages, but they had a, a master project where you could actually bundle that and it would pull these views in and provided routing that was a much broader application. They could deploy the entire thing as a full suite. Uh, keeping those projects separate and being able to pick that I want in my MGIT configuration, I want to have the component library, I want to have this other uh, dev tooling library, I want to have this extra feature library, and then here's my app project. And you know what, I also want to check this app project and this app project. 
you could pick which ones go together, and but not pull everything. So that's one of the scenarios that they found very useful. Um, the idea of being able to say, I'm going to change something in the component library for my application. I only ever want to be working in my application until it's time for me to check, have I impacted the other applications? Then it's very quick for me to go take from this file of all the descriptions that we have that could go into MGit and pull out the other projects that I need to test, build them locally, and just drop into them, see did I break the way that the component works in those locations. So it's a way of um, very quickly bringing in those sibling projects that you would have to get everything for in a mono repo at a more granular re uh, level. And if you've got it set up, it's very fast. You could, you could add another project, do another mget sync, and have the other things in there, and then have this, the, that linking between them done for you by a tool like uh, Yarn Workspace or Lerna in, in a matter of just less than 15 minutes. Thank you. Behind me. Yes. Yeah. Oh. How we got it? It's um, really clear from the multi repo how you would share a module across multiple projects. Um, not as clear with the mono repo, short of just dumping everything in multiple applications in there. How would you, how would you implement reuse of? some of the modules from a mono repo in other projects. Sure. To give you the most extreme example, we actually have a Java project that is dependent on NPM modules. Oh, really? Yeah. So um, if you're using NPM modules, one of the things I guess I didn't really clearly specify here is if you're using NPM modules, regardless of whether you're using a mono repo or a multi repo, each NPM project that you have when you're, when you're working on it, these are, these are tools for being able to work across them. But to, to just share them and consume them, you probably should be using some sort of a NPM registry. Like NPM, um, we use, Jeremy, what's the one we use? Artifactory. Artifactory, thank you. Um, Artifactory, there's a couple of others. Uh, you saw there's the one you can do locally if you wanted to do that. Um, but publishing and then doing an import that way or uh, publishing, and then if you need to, you could actually push the, the um, artifacts, the bundled artifacts, out to a shared hosted location or even a CDN. At the end of the day, they should be consumable without having to go through all of this. This is more for creating a working environment and for getting yourself set up to be creating and, and working on these things and hopefully being able to test across the places where you, you know you have dependencies that you have access to right away. One thing I have also seen is that, um, that I didn't really touch on. Uh, I've had scenarios where there have been other third-party libraries where I wanted to make a, a PR, and it was going to make a, a change to the way a component worked. I could fork and pull theirs down as part of my mgit configuration, because it's just a GitHub repo, and it's, I have access to it. I was able to make the changes, test it in my application as if it had already been published, and, it, and see if it worked. So did that answer your question, or do you have a different yeah, scenario? Yeah, so. Okay. Oh, that's good. I have a question. Thank you. Um, it seems like most CI tools want you to point your project at the repo, and the watching is at the repo level, not a subter. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. So does that necessarily point you to a multi-repo, or is there some, some magic that you can do to have? So that's another thing where, as a, uh, on an individual case-by-case -case basis, your teams are going to have to figure out Mono repos, you're right. You change one of them, your CI is going to run, and either you're going to have to teach your CI how to figure out that only one thing changed, or you're just going to run it across everything. And most people will just run your CI across everything because it's generally that's the best, you know, that's the, the better practice, and it's the path of least resistance unless things get really so it takes forever to run across it all. That does happen. I've seen that happen. So that's where you know you start depend, depending on DevOps to do more, and, and they generally prefer not to do more if you don't have to do more. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's, there's pros and cons for both strategies. It, I wouldn't say that um, just because you've only changed one thing and your CI watches at the top level and it's going to run all of the tests, um, I wouldn't say that's a negative or a positive. 
it could be both depending on what you need for your your group. There are times when uh, using the multi repo, I have seen where people have done testing on the individual repos, and this is one of those things you actually should guard against. Um, you change one repo, it has a trickling effect, but the testing only ran on that one repo, or maybe ran on that one repo, and the repo that first updates to use it, but you didn't test across all the others that are about to use it, and so there wasn't, there wasn't any visibility to the fact that there was a breaking change somewhere else across the, the um, larger picture. Does that answer? And we have one right here. Yes. Yeah. So for development, how easy or complex it is to do multiple uh, different branching using mgit? Oh, so doing branching using mgit is extremely easy. Um, you, even on multiple repos? Even across multiple repos. In fact, it's, it's, it's easier to branch just what you want to work using a, a, a multi-repo with mgit, um, where you, you're just going to branch only the ones that you want. Uh, and and you can actually capture that mgit JSON. So at the top level, you have a, a, a project that is just your your package.json, your mgit JSON, and if you've changed it to indicate that you're now pointing to a branch that you created on your other Git repo, you can submit or you can uh, commit a branch on your top level one for someone to go pull, and they'll get whatever your mgit says. So if you've changed your mgit saying it does require you to com to do more com uh, more branching because you're not branching just one for everything. You're going to branch only the ones you want, and your top level project that has the the mgit JSON file in it. You branch those two or however many you need, um, and it allows another developer to pull it down and, and recreate the scenario you have. Okay. Does that answer your question? Sort of. So yeah, uh, there are some challenges there to yeah. keep track of, but so it's, it's doable. So the, uh, the mgit.json a description file that talks of, that describes what branchings you want for the entire multi-repo? Yep. Yeah. And um, if you reach out to me, I can send you uh, a couple links of places to look at where you can see where, oh, here's a branch. There was an mgit.json. You can see that they actually, in the mgit.json, for like they might have five or I think it might be seven uh, child projects that they describe, and the path that for each of them oh, points okay. to something in mgit, and on, on the end of them, there'll be a hash, and it'll be like a username slash their feature branch. Okay. And that means when you pull it down, you'll get their feature branch when you do the mgit sync. Okay. okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. We have one other? That's a quick question. Um, I know everyone's mm -hmm. trying to probably get out of here. So as far as like the mono repo architecture goes, like that makes sense to me. But um, specifically for my use case, like my company just acquired another company. We're going to start building out landing pages and eventually want to have like a shared library. So do you, have you come across any patterns for grouping components, maybe in kind of like sets, right? Like not getting so granular that you have individual components, but maybe we want like a set of form components together or a set of like login page or account page components and then you know how do you how do you manage that and then maybe even theming like how do you manage theming across yeah so there's that's that's a, a loaded question because there's there's a lot of different ways you can uh, approach that and and a lot of it's probably going to depend on what your team actually really needs to uh, approach the work uh, what direction they have to approach the work from and sometimes it might even uh, involve talking about how does your larger design and UI dev team think about the components and talk about the components and design as a whole. Um, most companies will start with something that's very granular components, buttons, input fields, uh, link tags, things like that, that that might be something different than what you get either out of React by default or from a library like um, Material UI or React Strap. Those are popular libraries that people will use, but then you want to wrap your own uh, extra layer around it to either put things in by default or just make it so it automatically has your theme and your look. Um, I think most of the time I see people go, you've got your base core component library, and usually your theme kind of goes with that. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but then you start talking about your more complex, and um, I call them composite or um, yeah, composite uh, components, where you're actually creating almost like a little widget out of multiple things. 
Uh, so you have a, a container with a title and a horizontal bar, and then you've got some specific uh, elements within it, and this is a pattern that you use over and over, but this is more complex than just your individual elements. At what level you start breaking these apart uh, is, is something you're going to have to think about. Um, I generally tell people don't break things apart until you actually need to, and don't worry about it until you start feeling like you should be worrying about it. Uh, component, component libraries can generally get pretty big um, before you really feel yourself getting bogged down. The, um, some exceptions where you might want to think about it earlier is where you have specific teams, and in your scenario, you've just acquired somebody. You have one set of teams that's comfortable working with one set of code for their components. You have another set of team that's working on another set of compon uh, components, and they actually can stay separate for now. There's no reason to actually have to bring them together. Is that a good strategy for saying they can be separate NPM packages? Because you can import them both and leverage from them both. It's only when you start seeing overlap or you start seeing conflict that you might want to really start figuring out, do I merge them? Um, but as far as like how you break them out or how you group them, you can, you can logically group a lot within a single package, just either with your file hierarchy or naming conventions, it might be wise to start there. Uh, and like I mentioned before, the more you break things apart, every time you break a new package out, and especially if you start breaking a new package out and then you have one of those get inherited by this package and now this other package, and those both go into a feature or an app, as soon as you start getting to that kind of extra breakout, you're going to be adding extra levels of things that suddenly something will break or it won't resolve right, and you just can't figure out why. And somebody's going to end up spending three to four days of banging their head against it, saying the error message is not what it is. That does happen. Hopefully, you'll be able to keep it logical and keep it that kind of thing from uh, happening very often. But when it does happen, it gets painful. So it's one of those things just to, sit, to kind of keep in mind, saying don't break it out until you actually feel like you have a good argument for it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much.